everyone! Welcome to Future Proof, where I nerd out about classic sci-fi staples and their real-world counterparts. I'm your host, Michael Swaim, and if you're looking for my real-world counterpart, he manages a Jiffy Lube in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. Terrible man. Just the worst. Anyhow, today I gotta go fast, like so much Sanic the Hedgehog, because we're talking about hyperspace, subspace, and all the other made-up spaces that help our fave starships explore the cosmos at faster-than-light speeds. That's about a billion kilometers an hour, which is how fast something moves when it has no mass whatsoever, like a photon. Photons are straight-up anorexic, B. And A, they're waves of electromagnetic radiation traveling through space at the speed of the cosmological constant, which they indeed define. Okay, let's science. Now, in the sci-fi pulp of the 1950s, we didn't even need faster-than-light travel because our own solar system was still rife with mystery. In movies like Destination Moon, The Flying Disc Man from Mars, and Stranger from Venus, you know, those famous movies we all know and are still aware of, we imagined alien creatures emerging from local space. Interestingly, even 50s sci-fi sometimes referred to sub-etheric space, a play on the old-fashioned and bullshit idea that space is filled with a medium called ether, through which gravitational and electromagnetic forces travel. At any rate, now that we know our cosmic backyard is completely devoid of intelligent life, arguably Earth included, sci-fi has had to go farther. Without hyperspeed, Star Trek's Federation and Star Wars' galactic empire would take eons to traverse, and even communicating would be a huge problem, especially if you've got one of those Vader voice box wheezy things. According to Einstein's theory of special relativity, you can only feel movement when you're either accelerating or decelerating. That's why you feel like you're sitting still, even when your self-driving Tesla malfunctions, cranks it to 100, and cruises right off the turnpike. The thing that's unique about light is it goes the same speed no matter what your frame of reference. No matter how fast you go, light still looks like it's going away from you at light speed on account of those massless photons. That makes the idea of ever catching up to or surpassing it not just a matter of getting LaForge to route more power to the warp drive, but one of violating the basic laws of the universe as we know them. So, instead, most current sci-fi uses the concept that hyperspace or subspace are alternate dimensions, and by traveling through them, you can traverse more space than in our home dimension. Stars, Trek, and Wars both rely on this model, as does Event Horizon. Of course, in that case, subspace is hell, and you get there by jamming a pencil through a folded piece of paper. Minecraft kinda has the same deal, since one block in the nether, aka Minecraft hell, equals eight in the overworld. In Marvel canon, most teleportation is accomplished via subspace, and subspace is also the dimension where extra mass goes when superheroes shrink, or where extra mass comes from when they grow. Ant-Man has like a timeshare there. On the DC side, the Flash can canonically run faster than light, which is nuts, because reverse Flash is sometimes depicted as running faster than that. The astral plane in Dungeons and Dragons works similarly. That bag of holding your paladin picked up is actually a portal to a pocket of astral plane, and you tunnel through the same plane to teleport or apparate. Of course, in Harry Potter, you can travel instantaneously by throwing green snuff into a fireplace, because Harry Potter is stupid and for children. Slipping into an alternate universe isn't the only way to achieve fictional faster-than-light travel, though. Take Stargate, the forgotten third sibling of sci-fi things that start with star. It relies on the wormhole theory of hyperspeed, which is a series of linked portals that dematerialize and then rematerialize you, like a souped-up form of teleportation. It kind of looks like going through a glowing water slide. In theory, a civilization advanced enough to move wormholes around and survive the trip through them could set up a network of them and skim around to wherever they need to be. Although a legit wormhole has never been observed in our universe in real life, lots of physics proofs, including Einstein's theory of general relativity, mathematically call for their existence. And who are you to question Einstein? No one, that's who. Unless Niels Bohr is watching this video, in which case, sincere apologies. Another classic banger, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, good stuff, relies on an infinite improbability drive that projects a starship to every conceivable point in every conceivable universe simultaneously 
to forgo all that mucking about in hyperspace, although how the ship decides at which point to emerge is never fully explained. My personal favorite are the ships in Futurama, which move the universe around themselves instead of moving through the universe. Not to mention the fact that scientists in the Futuramaverse increased the speed of light in 2208 to allow for faster ships. That's a complete load. Nothing's a complete load. Not if you can imagine it. How could we make even that nonsense possible? Well, one way would be to shrink the universe while keeping the speed of light constant, therefore making it relatively faster as it traverses what we perceive to be the same amount of space in less time. Another way would be to get as high as possible off an old can of paint. Go ahead, try it. So, if we accept that there's no way to break the laws of physics, is there any conceivable way to travel faster than light by merely bending them? That's a hard maybe. In 1994, physicist Miguel Alcubier proposed the kind of warp drive that, at least theoretically, gets around this whole speed limit problem. The reason propelling something as fast as light is seemingly impossible is that things gain mass the faster they travel. Therefore, anything with any mass at all is only going to get heavier and heavier as it speeds up, requiring more and more energy to accelerate it, and thus it can never keep pace with a massless photon. At light speed, you'd need an infinite amount of energy to keep pushing the infinite weight of your ship forward. What the Alcubierre drive supposes is that a ship could travel as fast as 10 times the speed of light by creating a warp bubble around itself, which is to say, shrinking space-time in front of itself while expanding a bubble of space-time behind. According to most calculations, this would still require a tremendous amount of energy, say the equivalent of the entire mass of Jupiter. In other words, the Enterprise can zip around all at once as long as it devours planets faster than Galactus. Several notable physicists have added to or improved upon the Alcubierre drive idea, perhaps most famously Harold White. He proposed throwing a torus of negative mass around the ship, which for reasons I don't fully understand would make the drive much more energy efficient. In fact, he and his team are currently at work trying to prove that this kind of warp bubble can be observed in real life, and they claim to have created a little tiny nanoscale one in the lab. Unless you think he's just some lone lunatic, like that fabulous bastard from Ancient Aliens, you should know that he's an award-winning NASA engineer, and the experimentation is being done at NASA's Advanced Propulsion Physics Laboratory. That's about as official as you can get, or else an incredible waste of American tax dollars, depending on your viewpoint. In May of 2021, White announced that they might have found the right configuration required to test a chip-scale Alcubierre drive. Now all we need to do is download all of our consciousnesses into computer chips, and we're good to go. Perhaps the biggest logical leap necessary to get an Alcubierre drive off the ground in real life is that it requires negative mass in order to function. Negative mass is just what it sounds like, the opposite of mass. So that means instead of accelerating in the direction that it's pushed, it accelerates backwards, opposite-wise. This was long thought to be merely hypothetical, but in 2017, Washington State physicists created the conditions for negative mass by cooling rubidium atoms to just above absolute zero, creating what is known as a Bose-Einstein condensate. And what a condensate! Under these special circumstances, particles move extremely slowly and behave like waves. They also tend to sync up and travel together in a pack as a substance known as superfluid, which is capable of flowing continuously without losing energy. Long story short, the WSU team shot a bunch of lasers at the superfluid, because real physics and fake physics are hardly differentiable. The lasers affected the spin of the rubidium atoms and turned them, at least briefly, into objects with negative mass. In theory, you strap a bunch of those bad boys to a torus and eat Jupiter, and you're halfway to a functioning warp drive. See, that wasn't so hard, was it? Faster than light travel may still be little more than a gleam in some four eyes as four eyes, but it's our only hope for ever meaningfully exploring beyond our own solar system. Of course, the faster you travel, the more time dilates, meaning everyone you left behind will be long dead by the time you reach your destination. But we'll worry about that on the next episode of Future Proof. Hey, that's this show! 